Thanks for um, uh, watching another episode of a uh, YouTube video by Joe Connors. I am going to work on a piece today that I'm going to put on Instagram that's one of my favorites. It's a Haydn symphony um, and it's called Trower, number 44, and it's not played that that often, although of the Haydn symphonies, it's probably one of the most I've played ever particularly across orchestras. In Grand Rapids, they used to play a, a Haydn symphony, and they still do, for every year that the orchestra has an anniversary. So I think I was there for like 76, maybe 75, 76, 77, and maybe 78, because I did three and a half seasons, so I think I played 78 symphony there. And then um, in Atlanta, I played Trower, 44. And in Philadelphia, I played Trower, 44. But I've also done like, oh, what do we do, like an 80, Seven maybe, and then we did a 104 recently, and we may have done a 100. That may have been with Yannick. So Haydn is of, is of the of the uh, realm of Mozart, and this is Haydn 44. And Haydn wrote a lot of symphonies. He had 60 more to go after this one. <laughs> uh, so it's uh, it's fair to say that this came earlier. Um, and whenever I think of early classical with like Haydn and Mozart, I think, I actually think a little something closer to Baroque. And what makes this symphony so great is it's so, um, all the drama. To me, it's got a lot of Baroque drama. The minor key, the, um, and the aggressive counterpoint, I like to call it, because uh, there's a lot of big column response and very expressive music making. And I, I just... Oof, I, I love that about the, the Haydn symphonies in particular. Haydn, people don't give Haydn, I think, sometimes. I think everyone goes Mozart, Mozart, Mozart. Yeah, 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 he was a genius. Yeah, we get it. But <laughs> um, uh, Haydn, he did some really incredibly musical and um, groundbreaking things, both harmonically and, and how he wrote that was innovative and uh, progressive for the time. And I... That just makes me really, really love his music. And again, one of my favorite periods of music to play is the Baroque. So the fact that we have the classical, I guess you can almost say the refinement, meeting the, the rawness and the uh, gravity of, of the, the Baroque air is why this piece works really well for me. So it has all the general, um, general things you would think um, you would see in classical music. <laughs> Even this opening theme is actually in unison. So the question is, so I, it's, it's funny, you could go, the phrasing here is interesting because I haven't studied the score, but the, because you could phrase, or you could phrase to, I think, I think it might be duple, like two. But da 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 da. And I, I think even if the, I think the goal is the last one. Uh, so uh, that, but I think it's it's still. So there is da 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 because later on this da ti da ti pa ti da ti pa ti da ti pa ti da da comes up a lot in the score, and I think. Uh, we have to answer it in that way. But I think phrasing-wise, yeah, I think that's, that's, that works. And that, so I want to do that phrasing, and I like to exaggerate it. So so you notice, sorry, I'm thinking and talking at the same time, but how much I I really phrase that. It's, it's not, uh, we don't want... 
that, that doesn't sound very um, accurate. But it, it, it's not very musical, I don't think, because it doesn't show the gesture, which is honestly, in Baroque music, everything's about gesture. So you really want to have this. I feel like I'm I'm playing it in hyperspeed mode. I haven't actually practiced practiced it yet, so my fingers need to um, uh, warm up. But when I get to um, that's the next kind of lick in this. And here I utilize the open string, and then so what I need to make sure I don't do is use too much bow on that uh, and be to end up in the wrong part of the bow. Yeah. If I can just let that, that, that go, that would be great. And I'm going to do a little bit of a skip. Um, uh, and then I'll keep going. So that, that's one example where you have this um, ascending line and that motivic figure is repeated over and over again. show that direction. Um, uh, 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 there's no crescendo written in the part, but again, in Baroque music, if the line is going up, that's a good time to do a crescendo. If the line is coming down, this is a good time to do a day crescendo. And then now, this motivic figure, ba da 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 just even that opening uh, is repeated here in this next figure. So why do I know to go... Why am I adding that accent on that first beat? Well, if you know the music, after we do the da, 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 they, the violins go ba, de, 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 and we answer them. So, uh, if anyone's seen my Mozart 41, the fugue um, section, the there's a uh, I, I was singing and playing, and there's a part where we actually answer the violins, and if it's really helpful to know that you do that because then you can actually phrase in the same way they would. Da -dee -da 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 -dee. So what happens musically and on the page? And that just makes the counterpoint pop up on the page. It makes it a lot of fun. So much fun. Uh, so much fun to play. So we have this. This uh, nice counterpoint figure. Now this is an octave, but it's not in the same. It's not the end of it for like this. It, it, it's just. It's um, almost like a decoration of the D. It's actually. That's all that's going on. But we, he he decorates by adding these other notes. So re do C. That's what the music is, and he adds these, these decorative figures <laughs> in this counterpoint point, um, of the line to make it, of course, more interesting. So, so whenever what's what makes this work and makes the counterpoint work is, I wouldn't necessarily I wouldn't whack the low D, but what I would do is make sure it's very very clear that that hitting that actually. It um, gives it a little bit of spirit and actually helps with the counterpoint um, in, in hearing the counterpoint when listening to the score. So, and that, um, I think these might be on exploring. So, he has this hooked. Uh, It's always just this phrasing of And again, all this is musically is That's all it is. And everything else is just a direction. I uh, mean direction. It's a decoration. So it makes sense. So it's almost like there's two parts even in this one line. Two, three, uh. Adding the second line. And then add the two voices together. Does that make sense? I know it's almost over 
overcomplicating it, but at the same time, that's kind of how the music works. So it's not, it's, I don't think of this as one line going with just, um, uh, where it's just, because I, I think it's way more um, musically complex than that. So to have this, to have the dunk, dunk, but spreading, um, spelling, that lower line, and then having the uh, uh, upper notes accompanying that. And then we have this. Um, so this is great, because the whole orchestra has this uh, figure. Uh, and again, it's one of those things, if you have the same figure over and over again, you could play it exactly the same way, or what is it trying to do? So, uh, okay. I think da 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 If anything, I'd probably go da 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 da, and then da 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 da. So it's one, two, three, and and we get to the D, which is our five or five to take us to. I say five or five because it takes us to G, which is actually the relative major for E minor. So. I'm trying to see if five and five is actually correct. Yeah, it's, it's your five. Oh, because it's not the five. Ha ha ha. So it's not five or five. <laughs> uh, but it's just the, the dominant of the, that's what I should say. Y'all, it's been a long time since I took theory. It's the dominant of our new key area, which is G major, which is the relative major of E minor, <laughs> which is generally where we land for any second themes in the, in the minor piece, we end up in the relative major often. So that's exactly what happened. And when that D is the dominant of this um, a relative major key. Sorry for that. Just want to make sure I'm being accurate. Um, so, and that's it. These are half notes. There are no dots written on them. Y'all, I've said it once, I'll say it again. This is why knowing the repertoire that you're playing is so important and what style it is. Because this is early classical, um, stemming from the Baroque, if you have, particularly in a movement like this that's presto in a finale, if you have quarter notes, you would not play them like it's Rachmaninoff. Rachmaninoff was, wasn't even a thought at this point, so... That, that doesn't... It's, there are no dots. I know there are no dots, but it's the style. It's almost like if you, um, I don't know, it's something as similar if you go to a concert and you know when the concert master walks out, you clap your hands. Like, well, some people say, well, why do you do that? Well, that's just what happens because that's what people do. Well, did someone say clap your hands? Like, no, because I just know that because that's what you're supposed to do. Like, it's the same thing. It's, <laughs> no one has to actually tell me um, to play this with uh, diction and articulation between each note because I know it's classical music and that's what you do when you play classical music. I hope that makes sense. Okay. Um. The other thing I was going to say is I also don't play with a lot of vibrato, again, to match the sound. So I think it's... Do you notice I, I don't like... Because it's just not necessary and it's not in the spirit of the music. I think it's, 
as um, uh, a conductor, Otto Mueller, would say, it's almost like it's cholesterol in the sound. <laughs> it's like this, which is actually a great image. Oh, if it's, it's kind of bad if you if there is a cholesterol, but I think like it's almost like having fatty tissue in the blood, so it can't go through the heart, and that just meant you want something a little more free flowing here. Uh, so we need to get rid of that cholesterol and have that. It's the sound doesn't want that. It needs to be cleaner. And y'all, there's a time and a place. This is your fruit. This is your cantaloupe. This is your kiwi. This is your pineapple. This is your strawberry. This is your blueberry. That's what this is. If you want a croissant, if you want pound cake, if you want fried chicken, then that's what Rachmaninoff is. That's when you can, you, that, that, <laughs> you can get all the richness and the butter and the, the uh, southern cooking that you want. This is, a, this is not southern cooking, y'all. This is, um, uh, I don't know. I don't want to get in trouble saying the wrong thing. I'm from the South, so I can talk about the South. So the next thing about looking at Haydn and this energy, and I was talking about how the, um, uh, there's kind of like this, um, not darkness, but this energy in the music, is just looking at the information that Haydn gave us. This is presto, and it's an E minor. And this presto, I mean, in cut time. <laughs> so he wants it to, to really um, to move along. And what's interesting about this is you hear it like the da 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 sound like quarter notes. I mean, they sound like eighth notes, but they're actually quarter notes. So this is in cut time. The one, two, three, four, 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 one. Two, three, four. <laughs> yeah, um, but it's, it's um, uh, so it actually moves along the page quite quickly. And what we have to do is make sure um, we can capture that energy because sometimes the composer gives us a sense of the energy just in how um, they write their tempo markings and their time signature. Uh, so this is very clear that it's supposed to be quite fast. Presto in cut time. Um, so cut time is in two. I mean, he, 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 it's supposed to you know, have that kind of energy. So that's one great thing about um, uh, having the information, but also it's what makes playing this music so much fun. It's athletic. It's um, it's also while while being very um, agile. Uh, it, it, it's just a real pleasure to be able to play this type of music, um, particularly like with my colleagues in the in the orchestra, uh, because you can capture all of these intricacies, these delicacies, but also this energy this intense energy that this piece has and that intense energy that I think Haydn just had inside of him because Haydn wrote some really, really great and exciting um, symphonies. His chamber music is amazing, his string quartets. I mean, I think any chamber musician will tell you that you cannot be a real quartet if you do not have your Haydn quartets mastered. And um, there's a reason for that because it, it, it's, he really does. I mean, he, he has an innovation in his writing that to me, and this might be a little controversial, but might be broader in scope than even Mozart. Where I feel like Mozart, I mean, he did what he did well, and he, I mean, it's amazing, it's really, really great. But I feel like Haydn really is that stretch from one era of the Baroque to, um, to the classical, and maybe with some, with some vision beyond. And um, to have that is just really, really spectacular. So. Um, I'm not saying that Haydn was a better composer than Mozart. <laughs> I just think there might be a breath in his, his writing um, that, that, might, that might be even beyond what Mozart did, um, which Mozart did, of course, ridiculously well. So I know that might be controversial, and that's me just talking off the top of my head. So um, that is how I feel. So, um, so the most, most important in this excerpt is that keep the energy, keep that energy up, keep that intensity up.
things I've thought about. Uh, we we're actually already prepping that dominant a lot. Uh, to, to, to basically, what we're trying to do is tonicize, which means make G major sound normal. And he does that after we do this little sequence. He's really, that E flat going to the D is really to that G major. And after he, after he does that a while, then G major sounds quite right. And then we keep going. Uh, and then we have another D. Back to G. But then if you take the repeat, um, it'll take you back to, to that minor. And actually, before the repeat, it takes you back to B, which is your five of one, which is E minor. That make any sense anyway uh, again I'm not a, a scholar on on um, harm, harmony but it does play a crucial role in how I play and how I approach the music and that's why I think it's important to know sure I'm continuing to phrase the way I want to with this particularly when it's in the sequence going up I just make sure I keep that going which is great and then I just want that teeth that that's super clean so I can't believe you made it. Again, to the end.
end of the video. That's amazing. Now that you're here, if you haven't done it already, make sure you subscribe to this channel. And you can even hit that alert button to remind you of when the next time, or not remind me, it doesn't remind you, it actually alerts you to when I upload my next YouTube video. I'm also on TikTok and Instagram as Weathercleft. That's how a lot of you know me, it's Weathercleft. Thanks so much for watching. 